I'm so excited to bring you this episode with Sally K. Norton. Sally is the author of Toxic Superfoods, and she is an Ivy League trained nutritionist, was a vegetarian vegan for a long time, and then realized that toxins that are naturally occurring in plants were really hurting her. So it's an eye-opening conversation. If you have never heard this before, it will be eye-opening. For a lot of you, you may have heard that there are you know, toxins or these anti-nutrients that are naturally in plant foods, but we have, it's a really uplifting conversation, I promise. And we talk a lot about Sally's journey, but also um, what's in the new book, Toxic Superfoods. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed talking to Sally. Welcome to the Nurse Salt Podcast. Um, just, I'm, I can't even tell you how exciting this is for me personally, but I'm also just so excited for everybody to keep hearing this. Awesome. That's good to meet a new soul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't think my audience knows about your story and I'm not sure. I mean, they know me and I'm always talking about food and meat and how important meat is for mental health. Um, but I'm not sure that my audience knows that much about oxalates, but I wanted to start with your, I mean, here you are. So you are, I don't know how old you were at the time, but you're Ivy league trained nutritionist. You've got a master's degree in public health. You were a vegetarian and a veggie lover, like from childhood. You're the kid that was coming out of the garden, eating the veggies as you're walking out in the garden. So you love vegetables. And then your body is telling you, no, thank you. Like something's not right. So tell me what was going on. What were the physical symptoms? And then at what point did you start to figure out that this might be the food you were eating? Well, I started having arthritic pains and back pain when I was 12. Okay. Young, right? Young. When I, I started gardening very early, started eating vegetables when, you know, I got off breast milk, which <laughs> wasn't very long. I was on breast milk. Like, so uh, there have been signs for 30 or 40, 40 years before mm -hmm. I figured this out. Uh, that's the sad part about this problem that I'm teaching is that it's hiding in foods that we trust would never be suspected. I think of it as like the greatest Agatha Christie ironic twist ever, where the most innocent little cute little teenager next door is actually the murderer. <laughs> right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, it gets away with this oxalate is a natural tiny little compound. It's it's called a dicarbolic acid because it has two carbons that each have the two oxygens on them. And it's easily formed in nature. Plants make it for self-defense and for lots of other purposes for their just normal metabolism and survival. And molds make it in the soil. Even polluted air can generate oxalic acid. It's really easy to generate. So this little oxalic acid compound is a great uh, chelating acid that picks up minerals. So it's been used in industry as a cleaner and a bleaching agent and all kinds of purposes in, for since the late 1700s. Right. You can right. buy barkeeper's friend, you know, so technically um, in foods that we eat that still have a lot of this oxalic acid and the crystals that it makes are things like spinach. You could literally take your spinach smoothie and clean the rust off your patio. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, you're cleaning the minerals out of your teeth and your bones and messing up the electrolytes in your body in ways and in, in damaging cells, cell membranes, electro and cell maintenance, cell self-regulation on this very subtle kind of what we call subclinical level where you don't get symptoms. So no one knows about oxalate. It's weird because oxalate, which is the salt form of oxalic acid, mm -hmm after the, when the acid's grabbing minerals, right. is the main ingredient in a kidney stone. Right. Right. So everyone's heard of a kidney stone, but your doctor never says that's an oxalate stone. They say, oh, it's some kind of calcium stone. Right. Oh, well. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> right. That's what. Uh, how much spinach are you eating? Do you love almond smoothies? Are you on a keto diet full of almond bread? Do you do dark chocolate every night? 
no one asks you that when you get a kidney stone, let alone looking at all the other problems that oxalate cause. Yeah, which we're going to get into because it's a lot. So for you, you were having a lot of pain, arthritis, and you were even teaching people how to to cook vegetarian. And you were, I imagine like this had to be a, a very strange shift for you when you started realizing some of your favorite, your sweet potatoes. I'm a big sweet potato fan too, but like <laughs> things, you yeah. know, cause I've heard you say like, I was hanging on oh to the sweet gosh. potatoes till it's the end. It's a big punch in the gut because you've been trusting these foods. You've built your beautiful lifestyle. You've invested emotionally. You believe in it. You think this is what's helping you. And yeah. ultimately it was the bad guy. And I, like, I had this whole garden, I, you know, the, the, the irrigation system alone was over $5,000, let alone all the other stuff. And every weekend and all my special mail ordered seeds that are biodynamic and organic and special, you know, I pick out my kind of tatsoi and my kind of this and that. Like I have a very gourmet garden out there, put in so much energy, miss church several of Sundays so I could have cute grass, you know, like I'm into the gardening and the plants. And, and I'm like, that was all a big waste of energy and money. And it's been ruining my health. Like, how could that be? I had to take a whole year off of gardening. I just couldn't cope. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I really relate to the resistance to this information because we don't want to hear about our dark chocolate and our keto bread and our spinach smoothies and our sweet potato, our daily blobs of melted butter on roasted sweet, sweet potatoes. Like, really that's the problem why uh what right it's particularly disturbing for me which is that level of disturbance really motivated me to write this book because mm -hmm. how could i have all the experience i have professionally have been trained at cornell in nutrition yeah. and gotten this public health degree and been looking at prevention and how to get people to not be sick how to age successfully how could i be so ignorant to be sick myself. Right. Right. And this is, it's not ignorant because this is what's perpetuated. It is, and it isn't, but the fact that you were open-minded, you must've been in some severe pain to open your mind to the fact that it could be the vegetables, these superfoods could actually be the problem. For you. Right. Because the more education you have, the less open your mind is. You already know everything. And everyone thinks they already know everything. Anyone who's actually yeah. doing this deep dive in nutrition, listen to a million podcasts, you already know everything. So like this can't be true because it doesn't fit what you think you know. And right. so you know, I knew that oxalates were related to kidney stones. You do learn that in school. And you do know that people with kidney troubles should be on a low oxalate diet. And you do know that the doctors don't tell patients that. And it's hard to convince your neighbors and friends and family members Hey, you're in renal failure. You shouldn't be eating high oxalate potatoes, but all oh, the doctor's fine with it. So, you know, you can't, even the stuff we know, you can't help people with anyway, but it turns out that I had no education whatsoever in oxalate and none of us do. No one has actually thought about real life. People like me who was in great pain. I mean, I had to, I lost my career. Yeah. And had this hysterectomy and didn't recover from the hysterectomy. And I had this sleep study that showed the reason I couldn't function is my brain was waking up 20 times, 29 times per hour. That's neuros, what we call, you know, excito, excitotoxicity. So the brain is toxic and excited and can't settle down and can't sleep. Right. Point of like no sleep. This is why I couldn't function in doing brain work or anything else. I mean, I couldn't recover from workouts, really couldn't do much at all. And so, yeah, I'm like deeply needing my life back, deeply needing to sleep. Thought it was SIBO because they say that's what's making your brain poisoned. Right. But the symptoms of the oxalate toxicity look just like SIBO. That is really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tested negative and insisted on treating the symptoms according to the theory that those symptoms had to be SIBO, which is this bacterial overgrowth where you get all this bloating and belching and discomfort and clear indigestion. But I didn't, you know, the test showed I wasn't producing methane. I didn't diagnose positive for it. And mm -hmm. it turns out the way that oxalate is messing up the nerves and then the muscles 
the electrolyte control and blocking enzymes. It blocks basic enzymes. It has these effects on the tissues that give you the same symptoms as SIBO. Right. So many people, I mean, I'm just hoping that the right people are hearing this, that people that are in pain that have been told that they probably have this bacterial overgrowth in their small intestines, they're doing all this gut healing. Maybe they're, they've found their way to a ketogenic diet and it's helped a lot with some things, but things aren't clearing up and they're not feeling great. Their sleep is still not right. They, they have these achy joints. I always hear too, feet. So when people have problems with their feet, I think of you and I'm like, oh, I wonder if this is an oxalate problem because I think, you know, most people don't think about their feet hurting and they've had problems with their feet for a long time, but also mood. Like this is really important for mental health and what's happening in the brain. And nobody knows about this. I mean, doctors don't know about this. Um, and I would say all plant toxins, it's important to be just familiar with the fact that the plants, they have natural defenses in them. I have so many neighbors and friends that get really defensive with me and they're like, <laughs> oh, that just can't be right. Like we need plants. <laughs> we need our fruits and vegetables. And they'll say, oh, I just disagree with you. I'm like, you're not I'm not, it's not my opinion. I, I'm not anti-plant. I think plants are amazing and they have natural defenses because they can't run away and they can't fight back. So it's just what's in them. So to be aware of that, just- There's so many sense. things in what you're saying here. And I want to get back to the pains and mention the neck too. So we'll come back around and mention the neck with okay. flags, feet, neck, mood, uh, think oxalate. But, yeah. you know, if you think about it, it's this kindergarten faith that plants are so benign and sweet and good for us. And they're all goodness that comes from propaganda. Right. And not growing up to the message of, yeah, plants wouldn't exist if they weren't toxic. Otherwise, they would have been eaten into oblivion. The ones who aren't toxic are extinct or they're in this museum called agriculture. Right. A museum called the grocery store. They're so heavily protected by us with our chemicals and our fences and our, the ways we keep the deer off of them and keep the bugs off of them mm -hmm. to protect these ones that aren't very toxic compared to the ones that will drop you dead in a heartbeat. Right. Uh, <laughs> their, you know, their defenses may be more limited because we've, we've developed plants to be more edible. But honestly, if you were to send those skeptical neighbors into the woods for two days and say, have a few salads while you're out there, have a good time, they're yeah. going to come back hungry or with squirrel blood on their teeth, one or the other. They're not right. going to live on the plants in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, haven't you people seen Into the Wild? Like <laughs> it's there. And, and often people will say to me, well, um, you know, that's something about something being healthy or natural. I love that natural that, and I'm like, well, kudzu and poison ivy is natural, but I wouldn't suggest that you make a salad out of your poison ivy. I mean, <laughs> and I really am not anti or, or, or even the pine needles, like good luck with that salad. Yes, I know. I, that's so funny. They're going to come back with squirrel blood on their teeth. And these are even people that are meat forward are like arguing for their, you know, for plants. And we are told constantly that the plants are good for us and that we need fiber. If I hear one more time from a doctor that I need fiber, I'm like, okay, I won't even go there. It just makes me so angry that we're pushing things without asking people. We don't ask them about how much dark chocolate they're eating, their spinach and the smoothies and all the stuff that's perpetuated as healthy. It just is. Yeah. So that's why I'm no so excited to talk to you. The clinical side, like clinically, nobody cares about diet still, even though we've been, you know, it's most fundamental how you build your cells with your nutrition is so fundamental to your health. It's got to be 
diet has to play a role in all health and illness. That's why I went into the nutrition field, because if you right. want to help people be well and not sick, you have to know how to eat. And apparently we have no clue about that whatsoever. So, you know, I'm thinking we all need a big collective field trip to a good natural history museum with a little diorama with the, the early humans and their skins and their clubs hanging out in the caves on the icebergs. And, and before they go and put all those little broccolis in the diorama, you should go see it because those people are living in animal skins. They're living on, they're living in the ice age on primarily animal meat, and they are not looking up the fiber content every time they eat. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so did you start eating some meat did you figure out, did you, it's before, or did you, I don't know well, what happened I, first. I do want to come back to this sort of whack-a-mole idea too, where you can yeah. treat some symptoms and get some symptoms to go away and yeah. still be just as sick on really the main cause. Like if oxalate is poisoning you because you're eating a high oxalate diet full of chocolate, spinach, almonds, potatoes, sweet potatoes, quinoa, taff, buckwheat, whatever it is, you've got something in your diet and people are snacking on nuts like crazy now. They're really high in oxalate and other toxins that wreck your gut and then wreck everything else. Right. But um, let's see, where were we going? <laughs> yeah, but the whack-a-mole. The like whack-a-mole thing where you can, like I got my, th different things got better, but they weren't yes. really, the overall picture was degenerating in a way where you couldn't necessarily see it because it's letting me work. I mean, I did work again for a while. And so it was actually one of my clues is when I was in graduate school trying to get through statistics and just like wiped out on the sofa and un unable to get off the sofa, let alone really comprehend my statistics textbook. Right. And, and I was figuring out that my vegan diet, I wasn't really blaming the veganness of it. I was like, oh, now I'm allergic to wheat. Clearly I figured this out. And then I realized this, these like perma pimples, I had a couple of pimples that lasted like two years. Huh, were from yeah, my soy yeah. allergy. I've been eating tofu for breakfast most days on the vegan diet and uh -huh. I, realized I had to get off soy. And then I realized it was all the legumes. I had loved like um, lima beans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you had jars of dried beans up on the high part of the kitchen, you know, the of whole course. kitchen thing. Yeah. Um, I realized I had to get off both beans and wheat. And I'm like, well, vegan can't live without beans or wheat. So then I added turkey and then chicken. So I was willing to eat chicken, willing to put butter on things, realized I was completely salt depleted. I had grown up at Cornell. You're not supposed to touch salt or butter and or fat and no salt. So I had been starving myself of fat and butter. I was wiped out. Yeah. It never occurred to me that all my illness was because I was following everything I learned at Cornell. Like, <laughs> Now, before I went there, this guy who worked at GNC in the mall told me, don't believe everything they teach you at Cornell. When you get there, they're going to teach you wrong because he was like, because he knows they're anti-supplements, but they were so wrong. <laughs> I'm like everything. And it ruined me to be such a goody two shoes to do everything I thought was right. And so I ended up like needing Gatorade and stuff like this. Here is this health nut buying blue Gatorade because she's desperate for salt. And so that was long before I discovered the oxalate piece, long before that. And adding in some meats and stuff, let me hobble on and get, get some benefits from some of the therapies. So I right. carry on, but then, you know, what I had done was add sweet potatoes to replace all that bread. I was a bread addict. I love this fresh made whole wheat bread. I knew all the best places to get the best breads. And I was like, I could hardly get home before I wanted to eat some of it. I was really stuck on bread. And so the sweet potatoes filled in that carb addiction I had with the bread thing. Right. <laughs> and I never put it together that really soon after I started doing sweet potatoes every day, I got these crow's feet wrinkles. I'm in my mid 30 and all of a sudden I'm getting crow's feet wrinkles. I'm getting little brown spots all over my skin. I'm getting muscle knots right between the shoulder blades and the rhomboid area that was like a knife in my back at bedtime. And all kinds of stuff started getting worse, not better when I quit the vegan diet and started eating sweet potatoes. And I just had no clue, no clue, not listening not listening. Yeah. 
trying, but still trying to figure it out and still moving along and still doing like believing that sweet potatoes was the low ox, the low allergy refuge, kind of an <laughs> island in a big scary sea of my body's now reacting to foods. And at least I have this very low allergy food at the center of my diet. I can eat as much of this as I want because no one's allergic to sweet potatoes. This is the, the lore of the day. This is 25 yep. years ago and it hasn't stopped in 25 years. We still think it's true. <laughs> no. And I have a similar, you know, I, I grew up I was born in the seventies, the eighties were all the low fat. We did all the low fat. I was super into health and fitness with my low fat. Didn't, I mean, didn't dare put butter on anything. Now I eat butter. Classes were big back then. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But I mean, just never feeling good and having zero idea, like still trying to get all the plants and the fruits and the vegetables and the whole grains that were supposed to be helping us. Um, and I too have to kind of watch the, the addiction piece because I will, but a lot of people will make these changes that are healthy, right? Because we think it's a better substitute than the bread. Cause everybody, we know the bread must be doing us <laughs> that can't be working for us and all the carb addiction that can't be great, but we just move it around. And nothing is really, imp you're right, we hobble along and we're able to function and, and really pretty high functioning, frankly, getting degrees and moving along. I do the same. Like, yeah, I mean, I managed to work three years real hard on grant writing and, you know, we brought in like $25 million in funding. It was yeah. a lot of brain work, a lot of different stuff going on. It was intense and I was pulling it off. But that's because you get really good at pushing yourself and pushing yourself and pushing yourself and demanding this out of yourself. Yeah. And at the end, there's not much left when you finally let go of it. Right. So you finally let go when your husband finally, like there had to be, I think he came up to you and said, Hey, there might well, be I had this, I had this initial, um, you should think about oxalate epiphany when the VP foundation showed up on a web search after I had this attack of vulvar pain in 2009, I was still working. And I, because I was still working such an intense job, I didn't really have the time and brain space to understand the foods completely. Like, can I have carrots? Should I have carrots? Like all those kinds of, like, I was a little unsure, but, um, I, I didn't, really get too serious about oxalates till later. I mean, it helped me to realize that sweet potatoes and kiwis and certain foods were high in oxalate and helped me realize why I never could handle almonds and cashews. They always bothered me. I was like, ooh, I must be allergic to them. Um, right. Probably the high oxalate. <laughs> I was like, somehow I was getting immediate feedback on that. And I never noticed dark chocolate, which is should give you immediate feedback within four hours anyway. There is this delay, you know, because the oxalic acid has to get into your blood and start screwing up your blood and your liver and your organs and your kidneys eventually before you, you're going to necessarily notice that acute attack. So that initial exposure after the meal, there's going to be a two to five hour delay in the symptoms often, although in the, the um, some of the recent literature shows 40 minutes after you eat a yeah. modest spinach smoothie with about 700 milligrams of oxalate in it, um, that spinach smoothie was already wrecking your circulating immune cells in 40 minutes. Even though it takes like 10 hours to finish absorbing it all, it's in that four hours is the peak where you have the most of oxalic acid in your blood and in your urine. Mm -hmm. Within 40 minutes, you see this damage to the immune cells where they now are an inflammatory state and they're damaged. They're putting out these cytokines that can cause generalized inflammation as well. So you'd think you'd notice like, okay, an hour after dinner, I don't feel good. Right. But we don't necessarily. Right. Not or necessarily. We don't put it together, even yeah, if we, we notice it. Yeah, we definitely don't put it together. And I have people um, look for mood, digestion and energy. And so a little, so it could be quick. Some of us, I thought I was allergic to everything, right? I just had figured out, and that's why I went carnivore because I was like, screw this. I, I, and then at the, about the same time I found you and was like, oh, I probably should have gone slowly 
<laughs> off. So I don't have the oxalate, you know, clearing or what they call dumping. And I didn't really feel that that much because I still was having like my vitamin C, um, you know, there's still, so people might be like, oh, I might not have, I don't have the dumping, like with the, the aches and the pain and the stuff coming out. And then all of a sudden about two years into carnivore, I started getting tartar, like lots of tartar. And it's because I had quit the supplements too. And so now, and you know, so anyway, I found you because I thought, something just ha is not right. Like I'm allergic to everything. And it never occurred to me that it was the natural substances, like these chemicals defense the, that the plants have would have never occurred to me. And um, yeah, so it was amazing. Your story is really helpful though, because this is exactly what happens. You know, you hang on to your chocolate, your tea and your vitamin C and you say you're full carnivore and that's protecting you yeah. We haven't talked about this mechanism, but basically in the winter, when you're on the iceberg with the guys in the, the leopard suits, right. you know, you're not eating fiber, you're not eating vegetables. So you're on a, basically a zero oxalate diet in the winter time. And then when you're eating plants, you're adding oxalates to the diet. So the body doesn't, the, what happens when you're eating a lot of oxalate is you're accumulating deposits in the body. It causes the cell damage and inflammation that makes tissues sticky to oxalate too. So they get hung up in areas where you have infection, injury, inflammation, or tissues regenerating. When the cells are duplicating themselves, they're also in a state chemically that makes it sticky to oxalate. So the oxalic acid comes along, forms crystals in the body because it's grabbing calcium and other minerals, which tend to precipitate out when they get close enough together into these crystals that stick to these cells and this inflamed and damaged areas of the body. Then the immune cells come along and like try to contain this damage. Yes. They're already there because there's inflammation anywhere anyway. And if you're healthy, the body kind of sequesters and wraps them up and, and insulates yeah. these crystals. So then there's no symptoms. So there's a little bit of symptoms initially, this sort of initial exposure that's easy to ignore. And then you get crickets. It's nice and quiet because the body handles it and shuts it down, knowing that someday winter will come back and it can get rid of the sequestered stuck stuff that got stuck here. So the body's patiently waiting for winter when you quit eating all these raspberries and spinach and stuff that shouldn't be around in January, but you're eating it anyway. So you've messed up the beautiful part of winter that lets you get rid of these accumulated oxalates for decades and decades and decades and decades. And now you go carnivore. That's the winter diet, but right. you hung on to the vitamin C uh -huh. and, the tea. Tea. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the chocolate. And that's protecting you from deep winter where your body's like, thank God we can get rid of this stuff. And it doesn't realize it's dealing with 30 years of accumulation. And this is really can get quite dangerous. And apparently it doesn't even have to be 30 years. I mean, this kind of phenomenon where the body starts puking out these old deposits that have been accumulating in your body, which can include your poor thyroid gland and your bone marrow where your cells are born. Yes. It can occur even in young children. Even young children get into these episodes of really heavy oxalate moving out and the sort of the whole engagement of the immune system that's involved. So now, so it was your immune system that protected you and put them away but now it's your immune system that has to do this deaccumulation process and this sort of hazmat intervention thing. So out come the hazmat suits on these immune cells. They're trying to get rid of these crystals. They try to eat them. That doesn't work. So they send out more cytokines, which creates more generalized inflammation. Say, so bring me more troopers. We don't have enough of us to eat these crystals. They try to eat them in group. So they come together and they form these giant cells, you know, like, yeah. all right, one guy can't eat it, but 10 of us could. And then that doesn't work. So then they start spewing collagenase enzyme to break up the proteins that are around and in these crystals that yeah. are part of the body. And then, then spraying acid to break down the crystals themselves. So you get the hazmat process causes more temporary tissue injury and so on. And that's going to need repair. That takes more inflammation. So you can really get symptoms when you start clearing, but the tartar is evidence that the blood level of oxalic acid has been high because your saliva glands 
concentrate whatever's in the blood by 10 to 30 times the level in the blood. Yeah. The, yeah. So your saliva, when you have a high oxalate diet or when you're clearing oxalates from your tissue, you're still high oxalate, whether it came from the diet or came from last year's diet or last decade of sweet potato, yeah. that is causing this high oxalic acid in the bloodstream, which is bad for the vascular system, bad for your eyeballs, hard on the kidneys, hard on everybody. And the saliva glands increase the amount of oxalate in your saliva. Mm -hmm. well, it's also high in the blood that's in your teeth and in your jaw. So both sides of your mouth, inner in the vascular side and in the saliva side could be dripping in oxalate, which is really not good. You can get two sensitivities, you can get loose teeth, get all kinds of jaw stuff, lost jawbone, loose teeth and cavitations, infections like cavities and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Really terrible for the face. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Well, and it's also sinuses terrible. Sinuses too, <laughs> like sinus infections. Yeah, so I was going to say- You're wrecking the immune system and you're, you're, you're attracted to all this circulation, all this calcium, because it's attracted to calcium. So these fine bones, lots of activity, lots of blood flow. Yeah. A lot of oxalate can mess with the face. So you can end up with chronic sinus infections. Same with what seems like chronic UTIs and yeast infections. And if you're prone to these chronic infections, that's another flag along with the neck pain, the foot pain, the digestive problems and the mood problems. Here's another one. Got it. Oh my gosh. All these chronic infections. I'd, I mean, that's every, but every client I think I've ever had, even when I was only doing clinical mental health, you know, and we're so it's just all connected and it makes so much sense. So I think, you know, people might be going, oh my gosh, I got to get rid of my smoothies. I got, but I want people to realize they need to be careful here because, and they need to, um, you've got your book behind you, but for the, the people I've got it right here. Congratulations, by the way, on our, on this book is such an incredible resource, toxic superfoods. People got to go get it so that they learn how to gradually get this stuff out of their diet. So they don't, I mean, is it dangerous? Like those of us who just go straight carnivore, <laughs> do we need to go backwards? Because I'm really into seasonal eating now. So I'm not completely anti-plant, but I don't know, would you recommend people, if they're just getting started, I would say they need the book and they need to go slowly. But if somebody's already, um, you know, been eating carnivore, would they need to add some things back when they get some symptoms or what? Usually that's what works for most people. If they okay. start getting in and I've had people say they were fine on full carnivore after a keto diet, they'd done keto for three years, which meant almond muffins and almond flour or something two or three times a day for years. And they, he, he the one in particular, the whole, both the wife and the husband were in trouble with this and their kids. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, they had pregnancies while on keto and then went carnivore. And so the breast milk ended up dumping a lot of oxalate into the breast milk. So this poor child was grown as a fetus in a high oxalate body and then fed high oxalate milk as a newborn because of the clearing. It was the worst combination. And this poor kid still has tantrums and other issues, mood and symptom issues as she's she's clearing oxalates. Now they're on an oxalate aware diet. And so the kid has paid a price for that, but he didn't get the symptoms until three years after carnivore started. He had, he was perfectly symptom free on carnivore. And so it can happen either quickly or it can take years to, to unfold. I think people who are really deficient in minerals or whatever, their body just really can't do the clearing initially, but we have no science of looking at this. No one's really even acknowledging in science how common this accumulation is. Now, right. a few small studies on the thyroid show that 85% of us have oxalate crystals. This is basically like kidney stones stuck in your thyroid gland if you're an adult, like over 50. And the older you are, the more years you've had eating potatoes and things to develop these deposits. So even though we know that it's pretty common and like Anything over 20% is considered super uber common. 85% is might as well be everybody. And so if everyone's filling up with oxalate crystals, why don't we know this? Why does science think this only happens in renal failure? It is so glaringly untrue. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet so 
absolutely a fact in science. <laughs> so scary. So obviously not true. And yet they're yeah. saying you don't have accumulations until you have renal failure. 85% of us do not have renal failure. The kidneys are built to take it. They're tough. They're tough. They're, they have these redundant systems for dealing with this toxic load of, of oxalate that we're overeating. Yep. Our life. So there's the book will help you deal with like all of these. Well, the doctor says this and the world says this, and yet Sally's saying this, and the book will help you explain why I'm saying this. You right. Know, I'm part of the world too. I'm part of the world of public health and medicine and worked in two medical schools. I know what you think, you know, and I had to undo what I think we all know and get some facts straight. And that was the big research project of me living in the library for years and then trying to fit it all in a little book. So hey, please come, come learn this story because there's more than just, oh, go slow and here's some charts of oxalate. There's a whole backstory of where we're going off the rails culturally and scientifically, how we're missing this over and over again and continue to be resistant to the message. That's the sad part is like your neighbors, people don't want to know that you're better off without dark chocolate. Oh, I know. I didn't want to know that. I was, I mean, every friend I have is like, oh, I hate to see you without dark chocolate. And now it's been years, but yeah, I didn't want to give it up either. I, I mean, I know that we don't want to give it up. And I think, you know, and the book is so well laid out. And I think it's such a great resource. It's researched. I mean, you're obviously you were good at researching before. That's just a gift that you have of putting things together. That's how you were able to get grant money the way that you were. So, and I think the groups, you, so you're still running groups. I know it's pretty hard to get in with consultation with you because you're so busy, but the groups to have community of people that can help you through that, that seems like a really smart way to go for people. Yeah. And I'm hoping as I get more capacity, we'll have even more opportunities for you to get some kind of ongoing touch because you stay out in a regular world that doesn't know about this and you, it, it, any new learning evaporates very quickly. <laughs> yes. I've <laughs> found that. Dipping in. You have to keep staying in with those of us who are getting better on this. And there's lots of us. And you can get a taste for that. If you look at the reviews on Amazon, it's, the book's only two months old and we have some pretty powerful stories being shared just through these little reviews on Amazon and give you a sense of, mm, yeah, could be real. Could be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think about, I just went to a doctor's visit with my mother who's 78 and she's got some lots of swelling in her legs. She's got something going on with her kidneys and the PA who's very lovely. It's at her primary care physician's office and the PA very patient, very nice. And we're sitting there and I haven't, you know, I wasn't offended by most of what she was saying. And then she got to the food and she's telling my mom to make her own flaxseed muffins and to lay off of red meat and pork and go with the fruits and vegetables and make sure she does her grains for her fiber. And I about lost my mind, Sally. <laughs> I was like, as a nutritional therapist, I absolutely disagree. And if it had been my appointment, I would have ignored her. I would have thought, oh, you poor thing. I mean, <laughs> you know, but she got, we, I just said, I completely disagree. And I didn't want her to get to, I felt myself getting hot and I thought I'm going to have to leave the room. This is bad. <laughs> And my poor mom is super confused. Like the doctor people are telling her one thing. I'm telling her another. Of course, she tends to listen to me, but she has okay. a hard time holding this information. We're talking about 70 years of, you know, eating what you think is right, which has not been great for you. And now you've got a health professional telling you to, you know, lay off the meat. And then she started quoting a, is a doctor but he's paid big money to push the plant-based agenda. And I was like, oh no, oh no. So yeah, I have, I, I, yes, it's hard to hold on to the information, but it's hard to be out there and have professionals telling you things and, and to be able to come back at them. Like, I just want to drop off your book. I think I might at the doctor's office and say, 
Please ask the PA to read this book. Please, <laughs> just please read this book. So but I don't think she good. will. No, I think she's, I know. you know, very entrenched. And you're right. When you work all the time, you don't have much time. We tend to gravitate towards information that matches what we already believe. Right. And that's what I did for years. That's what you did for, and something has to happen for people to open their minds and say, oh, wait, we might be wrong about that. Yeah. And it brings up a really important point because that experience of you disagreeing with the doctor and them not getting you is incredibly lonely. You yes. really feel alone and unsupported and reading stuff and hearing stuff. That's exactly what you believe too. It's very like friendly and full of company. And so we'll gravitate towards this sort of sheeple mentality and just stick with the big story that everyone believes because yeah. there's a certain emotional safety there. It's an artificial emotional safety uh, and getting real with yourself. The cool thing about this journey of like kicking to the curb, a lot of the, what we might say, conventional wisdom mm -hmm. is you start listening to your own body and your own experience and making that the authority in your life. And all of a sudden you elevate yourself to an authority in your own life about your own body, about your own choices and your own future. And you start to have a deeper sense of self-respect. True. That is, and that's probably the best gift that all this gives us is listening to your own body. You have to. You really have to be able to start saying, well, I don't feel good. So something must not be right. And I, um, you're not, it's not because you're crazy, even though that's what the doctors want to say, psychosomatic. Oh, you need to right. de-stress, go ride a bike, go pick a daisy, relax. That's the kind of advice you get when you're like, something's really wrong with me. These, I feel kind of poisoned. There's something really not right here and your tests are fine. So it's just you. you're just a little weird that's the only thing you can come away with there's just some mystery about me i'm defective no your diet's yeah. defective right and the information we went i do want to just briefly talk about the mental health piece because i know i've got a lot of former students that listen that are all in the mental health field and so i just want them to hear how important it is to ask some questions about people's diets and and that we really can't as mental health professionals as doctor people we cannot ignore this piece um our diet is super important for our health including our mental health so i didn't know if you want to say oh, anything else you know that. it's been surprising to me the the amount of depression and anxiety that people have been suffering with that goes away on the low oxide diet there you go. It's very clear in this clearing, you know, where you're going through the deaccumulation process and your body goes through waves. When you're clearing, you feel hopeless and negative. You are Eeyore. You are not in good space. You're brittle. You're reactive. You're fearful. You're hopeless. You have way less excitement about anything. You're kind of lightly depressed with like, eh, whatever. I just can't get the juice going to care about my to-do list today. I feel a little overwhelmed or anxious with my to-do list, all these kinds of feelings. This is neurotoxicity. This is a brain that's not happy yeah. and oxalates because it, it, it's not just messing up the membranes that has to handle all the functions of life. All the enzymatic functions of life happen on membranes. Well, oxalate comes along, messes up the membranes, which messes up the electrolytes in the cells. It gets in there and messes up these little calcium sparks that tell the cell what to do. And of course, a nerve cell and a muscle cell, they're specially um, sensitive to these disruptions. And they're, the whole thing they do for life to keep you working as a nervous system is to manage electrolytes. And along comes this big elephant just crushing the all the glass in the store, you know, it's like, it's really not pretty to have your electrolytes messed up when your nerve cell. And it's also the process of the cell damage is consuming glutathione in cells and tissue. Yep. And so then you get a condition called oxidative stress because you've got this damage, you have free radicals going on and not enough glutathione to squelch it. And then you're in oxidative stress that increases the mitochondrial damage. The mitochondria produce the energy that allows the cells to heal themselves, repair themselves, do the work they're supposed to do when they're well, lower ATP in the cells. 
You've also blocking enzymes that create ATP. So you just got lower ATP because the enzymes aren't working. Right. And then you've got this immune activation going, wait a minute, wait a minute. My, and then the brain is like, ah, and the, the blocking of the enzymes can mean that you can't control your blood sugar. Right. The brain hates that. The brain does not want the blood sugar to drop. It wants a nice, even, slow pace of constant blood sugar. And when it starts getting panicky, and so you can do a lot for mood. And, it's, and now, now understanding oxalates, when you have a mood swing, mm -hmm. maybe that's because there's something going on with this deaccumulation. If you're on a carnivore diet, especially if you're if you're seeing your mood trash, you're seeing inflammation in your face. I mean, you're seeing the tartar. You might see crystal urine, which looks cloudy or burning stools, burning rectum, because your body's trying to get rid of it through the urine, mm -hmm. the stools, maybe the skin, the saliva, the eyes, if you get really crusty eyes. So if your mood is bad and you see some of these other signs, it could be the oxalates messing with your mood. Absolutely. Yeah. So many things we can talk about, but I really wanted to get that in there. So I appreciate that. So for you, are you eating plants at all these days or? Yeah, I um, had some winter squash last night with dinner yeah. and I have some papaya on the counter. We love our crystallized ginger in this house and I'm drinking some hot coconut milk right now. So I, I, I but I have to be careful with the plants. My body has just decided it's over them. <laughs> it's like, they bother me. I mean, my, it's like the plant kingdom itself. My immune system is like not having it. So, and I just had a breakout. I'm thinking, my gosh, I've had squash three times this week. Is it, am I reacting to the squash? I thought that was a safe zone. So I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty with this. Well, what's bothering you? But I'm one of these people who's been, put on a lot of antibiotics as a little kid. Same. And then I had these sinus infections every year from age 17 until when I started the diet. Now I haven't had a sinus infection in 10 years, but I had them for from 17 to age 49. So how long is that? That's too long. 32 <laughs> that is, years. That's way too long. Yeah. So that's way too many antibiotics. And so I think the antibiotics, and then they had me on NSAIDs when I had these foot problems, because I had to leave Cornell before I could finish my degree for surgery, was gone for four years on these high, high, high dose of, of Motrin, ibuprofen. And um, between the antibiotics and the Motrin and the high oxalate diet, the the whole digestive tract where half of your immune cell system lives. Yep has been, there's a certain amount of um, immune system derangements and you create dysfunctions that create these autoimmune like things and create this hypersensitivities. Yep. Now, generally my hypersensitivities are way better. I can handle electromagnetic fields much better. I can go to the mall now. I can handle shoe polish, my obnoxious darlings who wear too much perfume. I can handle that without so much headache. You know, it's life's better in every way, but I still seem to be reactive to foods and, and uh, even beef after I got COVID, the beef allergy, which was probably simmering along in a kind of subtle way became less and less subtle. And now I can't eat beef either. Uh, it's really clear. I can't eat beef <laughs> and that okay. caused serious problems, chronic facet joint arthritis up and down the spine, a big nodule on the thyroid gland and the development of lichen sclerosis, which is a nat nasty, itchy autoimmune thing in the skin because I was ignoring the beef allergy. And I think it really got crazy after COVID. So all these layers of things that cause immune engagement, immune engagement, immune engagement, immune engagement, your whole body's living in an emergency zone all the time because right. of things like the COVID, the oxalate crystals, which form nanoparticulate pollution in all your tissues. And the body tries to not be about them all the time, but it's going to do some of that when you get off of the oxalate and wants to clean it out. And we're kind of stuck in this ugly catch 22 position where you have to manage it. And yeah, that's yeah. where, you know, adding some tea, adding some olives, adding a few bites of sweet potato is actually helpful because it tells the body, oh, no, no, don't be overexcited about this deaccumulation. Take a break. So, you know, there's a lot of things to it. That's why coming to a group meeting and learning more and meeting others and reading the book and, and rereading the book and rereading the book because yeah. 
it doesn't soak in. I mean, I can reread this book and I spent years writing it and killing myself trying to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it to try to get it right and get it to fit down. Mm -hmm. The chapter 10 started off as 90 pages of notes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I kept going to your website. I would just keep re revisiting the website because you also, in your recipes, you have a lot of recipes that could be helpful for people. And there's a lot of information so between the book and your website and, and the groups, I think that's, that's where people can get the support that they need to start figuring this out and educating others and being able to really heal their own bodies. And that, I mean, we're going to have to, we have, we're going to have to do that. We're and it's still, yeah. And it's <laughs> trial and error, you know, forever because you can eat something for a while, like you were eating beef, I'm, I'm guessing. And then that a lot just, of it, a lot of it. Yeah. I eat a lot. I mean, I eat steak every day and I'm like, Oh no, if I have to, but I'm okay. Cause I want to feel great. So I want to, whatever age it well. takes, whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good with, because once you feel nothing tastes better than feeling awesome. Exactly. Nothing. And to be honest, I didn't know that I could feel this good. I, I just didn't know. And so once you get a taste of feeling good in your energy, so your mitochondrial health is better, mood improves, everything starts to get better and you want more because you want to keep going. So it is, even though there are rough patches where things will come up and you might get a skin thing or, or bumps or whatever's going on, it's just telling you that you got to look at things again. Or yeah, still. And, and then you get to keep going. You get to keep your life going. <laughs> you can still function. Like I can get on a plane and go give a talk. There was a time when I could not rely on my brain to even give a talk and be able mm -hmm. to function in that way, let alone deal with the toxicity of flying and hotels. It used to be that a hotel or flying, either one, would cause me to have severe back pain and fatigue for days. Yeah. No, yeah, I feel fine. I can actually kind of fake it like a regular person. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, because we need you flying around because we got we've got a lot of people to educate. I yeah, it's really lovely to meet open people like yourself who are learning this and getting the opportunity to really benefit from the information. It's sad when you have something that you know can benefit people, but they're not interested in it. So it's it's really great. You know, that's it's just the whole reason I wanted to do this because I knew there was someone else like me out there who needed a clue. <laughs> yeah. I was so like, oh, if someone's in my position, they go to their doctor, they don't help them. They go to the next doctor, then they go to the chiropractor, then they go to the acupuncturist, then they go to the massage therapist, then they go to the herbalist, then they go to the this and the that. And they spend themselves dry and not one of those people will clue them in that they need to be thinking about these certain foods that are high in oxalate. That isn't a thing yet. And so I thought, well, the other Sally that's out there might learn from me. Somehow I'll reach her. And I have, like there's tens you of have. thousands of people. Yes, which is, I'm grateful. I don't know how I stumbled upon you back in, in 2019, but I'm grateful that you, um, and every I'm, I still say, Sally K, Sally K, you got to find Sally K, um, <laughs> Sally K Norton. Um, because, and what I love is that more and more people know who you are. They know, they know a little bit about oxalate, um, you know, and oxalic acid and these illnesses that if you've got something weird going on, it's not getting better. Yeah. This is an important place to look. So yes. I know I'm mindful of our time. I know I could, I told you we could talk all day. I would, it's a I fun would conversation and there's so many pieces to it and it's really, um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't I get just, tired of talking about it. <laughs> no. And I just, the anti-aging piece, I'm turning 52, I don't know, next week or something. Oh, another Pisces. I'm an Aries actually. Oh, you're, oh, next week is I'm already, on the, I'm, I'm the 20th March. No. So I'm like two weeks away. Yeah. 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 yeah but the anti-aging piece is also quite exciting. I didn't, I didn't care that much when I started. And now I'm like, oh, that, that'll be a benefit. It's really a benefit. I, when I was eating the vegan diet and then eating my sweet potatoes, I felt like I was at least 85. I taught in retirement communities. I would teach yoga and things and hang out with people my age. And, and now that I'm 59, I feel like I'm 40 or less. And I feel better than I felt my whole adulthood now. 
I know. Isn't that amazing? I just think that's the best. I feel like the aging has stopped. Like those little age spots. Oh, I'm still working. I still have a ways to go, but I'm excited (laughs) because I I feel like I have the tools. So what else nourishes your mind, body, and soul? Oh, I know you eat well. Yeah. Eating well is helpful. And I um, have time out in the garden when I can. This book business has kind of wrecked me as a gardener. I've got to get my little soil blocks made for the spring seeds, but I have flowers all over my yard. I keep my yard really nice. I try to get outside and do walks. I make sure that I go to a minimum of three yoga classes, hot yoga classes a week. I try to get to the sauna. Those things really lower the inflammation and reset you. Mm -hmm. And I have my little meditation group and, and, um, you know, there's lots of little things that you, you gravitate toward that you're doing to help yourself be well, hopefully that you just can't even say because you just do them. (laughs) Right. It's just part of your life. Yeah. Yeah. But I really love coming home to flowers. My front walk has this the most abundant set of colors. So beautifully laid out right now with, with fragrance that I can tolerate just fine hyacinths and pansies and spring bulbs. And it's, it's, you know, food for the soul. Oh, that is gorgeous. Yeah. I can, you're in Virginia, right? Yes. I decided as a 12 year old, I wanted to be here because of the flowers, but I have a terrible pollen allergy. And actually during this most beautiful time of year, I have to run away and go to the beach a few times and get some ocean air. That's not so full of pollen. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. You get the both best of of both worlds. That's great. You know yourself and you know what you need. And I think for people to give themselves permission to, to learn more about themselves or know themselves well, and to be able to, we've got to start taking care of ourselves. We cannot rely on our doctors to do that. We've got to start educating them because they don't have time to, to get educated. And, you know, really respect your own experience in a deeper kind of way. And if you can have this information, it helps to make sense out of your experience that you're not crazy. Yeah. Really not crazy. What's happening with you is real. And that's really the basis of all my work. You know, I get to work with people one-on-one and continue to learn how this looks. And I'm every day I'm surprised at how each person has a different expression of this illness. They themselves are the ones who are convincing me they have an oxalate problem. And I'm like, yeah, you do. And, and they're thinking about it in a slightly different way than I am. And it's really helped me, um, it's so many ways. I mean, that I was looking for in the library, I was looking for explanations of why does so-and-so no longer feel like she's an addict and why is so-and-so got this and why are they saying this and why are these crystals coming out of their bodies? Like what is really like, you know, so I'm looking for an explanation of what we see in the real world. And that's not the case anymore in science or in medicine. They tell you what they're told is true and you're supposed to, you and your body are supposed to comply with what they say is true. So what you're reporting to them can't be true because it doesn't fit and they don't have a drug for that. So they don't have a drug for that. It doesn't matter, but that's completely the inside out from where we are in, in this, like what we're doing here is working with our real lives and then asking science, why is this happening? Not saying, oh, that's not happening because I don't know it and I'm the expert. Right. Right. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, Sally, I have enjoyed every second of talking to you. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Um, cause I, I have loved listening to you for years now and it's just been so helpful for me in my personal life and my work. I don't know that I would have recognized a lot of things in other people because I just wasn't taught. It's not how I was educated. So not at all. I'm so grateful that you're interested in sharing this with other people and really passing this forward. And anybody who's listening, who's passing it forward. If you are a provider, I do have my beginner's guide, which is a PDF on my website, but you can get it in print uh, through us. Maybe if we have them in stock uh, to, to share with your clients as a way of like having a brief conversation that's very efficient. They can take home with them. And that way they don't have to remember to look up the website or whatever. They've got a little tool they can walk away with. So if somebody's really needing that, you can reach out to us at my website and people can find a a bigger set of recipes and a PDF on my website as well. Yep. Which is all great. 
I mean, that's, I can't tell you how many times I sent people the link to your website and got them to print off things to help. Um, there was tons of information there. So it's very helpful. That's yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. It's been really fun to be with you. Look forward yeah. to the next time. <laughs> yeah. Love it.